Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Uh, today we're going to start a two-part program discussing the human figure uh, in art. It won't be chronological necessarily, but it will simply look at different time periods in the history of art and see how artists have explored the figure, well, how they've used the figure to express their own time, perhaps, or their own feelings about themselves, or their feelings about their own time. Uh, we will start out in our first picture, coming up very shortly, with the Kouros figure from uh, the archaic Greece peri uh, Greek period, about 600 BC. And we see in its strict frontality, uh, obviously, a reference to Egyptian art, the flatness of the shoulders, the hips untilted. There's a, a certain hierarchic, hieratic, a stiff, ritualistic quality. It presumably can represent the god Apollo or a, vic a victor at the uh, Olympic Games, perhaps, in a sense. And there's a certain crudeness of carving. If we, we can see the knees in the picture uh, at the moment, the folds of flesh hanging over the caps. The torso is undifferentiated in terms of, of its anatomy. There are certain broad, simple handling of the forms. And uh, it's, it's a solid, convincing statue, but we wouldn't say that it's exactly lifelike. In our next picture, we look at a classical Greek sculpture called the uh, Doryphoros, uh, executed in 450 BC, the, about the time of the Greek classic period, a period of of social and artistic balance, we might say. Uh, and the sculptor is Polycleidos in this instance. And look at the difference in the sculpture, look in the handling of the figure. The, there's a certain tilt of the hips as the figure, which perhaps bore a spear in its left hand, uh, seems to take a step or to balance its weight with a certain agility, the tilt of the hip the weight-bearing leg pushes the other hip up. But notice the shoulders themselves are still uh, horizontal, flat. There's a certain uh, greater sophistication in the handling of the figure as the artists become more experienced and as they seek to equate human perfection with the perfection of the gods, in a sense. We could look at the torso, perhaps come in a little closer on the torso and look at the detail of the torso and see that while it's more articulated, it's more realistic, it's more organic than the Kuros figure, there still is not a great deal of detail in this particular figure. And in, a, in fact, this perhaps is not one of the most representative figures of the age in terms of the height of achievement, although it is, was called the canon in its time in terms of its canon of proportions and uh, theory of relating parts of one part of the body to the other. But keep in mind the torso of this figure. And we move to the next uh, picture, and we see Michelangelo's uh, David uh, done in the early 15th century. And let's move in closer on that if we can, get more detailed feeling of the upper torso and body, and look at the taut tensity of the musculature of the torso, the uh, angle of the body leaning slightly to uh, our left. Look how the hip hips are tilted as the weight-bearing leg pushes the hip up and how the corresponding shoulder directly above it drops. So you look, look how the body now has become a totality, a totality expressing the potentiality of human movement. And Michelangelo adds another element to it, that of personality, of psychology, of an ultimate human hero in the sense that David represents in his slaying of the giant, in his slaying of the forces demonic forces of the earth in a sense that would override the powers of human intellect and, and human um, uh, creative powers in a sense. And we can see in his face some of the expressiveness that is, uh, Michelangelo is expressing and, and brings to his sculpture. We compare this with uh, Michelangelo's Pietà done around the middle of the 16th century. And uh, the realism, of course, is strong. Uh, some parts of the figure are thoroughly carved, as in the figure of Christ and the helping, supporting figure on our left. The figure above uh, presumably is a self-portrait of Michelangelo, and he speaks of his involvement in the mystery of Christ. And in much of his writings, he, he prays for uh, to be saved from his own sins and from the sins of the world. 
uh, from his vanity and his lusts and so forth from to be saved by Christ and the Christian message. If we look at the sculpture as an overall whole, perhaps pulling back on a little bit, we can see some of the almost manneristic, expressionistic relationship of arms. Uh, the Christ's two arms and the supporting arms of the figure on the left seem to form almost a, a triangle or a very expressive, taut relationship of arms and legs that will that expresses Michelangelo's own taut emotionality and will presage the extreme distortion of forms in a mannerist painting and sculpture which will follow it. L look at this relatively uh, realistic version of the Pietà with the later version of the Pietà, the Rondonini Pietà around uh, toward the end of Michelangelo's life. He worked on it for perhaps uh, uh, 10 years from 1555 to 64 and there's a certain manneristic angle of the legs in relation to the torso. It's very simply modeled in contrast to the extreme detail of his early torso of David and even Christ's torso in the last uh, Pietà. And one senses almost the advent of modern sculpture with some of these later uh, Michelangelo sculptures that are in one sense unfinished. Uh, he, he, hews them out of the living stone. He says the stone contains the image and it already contains it and that it's his role as sculptor to bring them out. And uh, as he slowly works and he ages and perhaps he doesn't finish because he's inv involved in many other projects, tombs and of course the Sistine Chapel in the early uh, 1500s, that left in their unfinished state they become very expressive, almost expressionistic and will supply later artists with inspiration to emulate his wonderful understanding of gigantic musculature or the movement of the body or rough unfinished stone as in the hand of the supporting figure, whether it's Mary or some uh, John or wh whoever it is against the smoother body of Christ. But all of these figures have a certain hu humanity, a certain idealized humanity and a certain realistic humanity. It's, it's hu humanity uh, made greater than perhaps we are in our physical sense. I mean, we all have physical flaws. Perhaps there are symbols of what we may attain through greater understanding, spiritual sensitivity, our own sense of creativity. Look what happens to the human figure in the 20th century. In this uh, sculpture of Ella by Carl Walters in 1927, a uh, ceramic uh, sculpture, and certainly the idealism from of the human figure as close representing humanity close to the gods or aspiring to the gods has fled. Uh, Ella is overwhelmed by her own flesh, her own corpulence, and one would say that there is a certain amount of realism in the picture, although the realism is generalized. We, uh, if we think about, maybe we can raise the camera up and get rid of that thing at the top, um, that if many of us walking around the streets with our clothes on, from politicians to housewives, uh, if we could see the flesh that was underneath, maybe quite a few of us would look like this, especially in this day of the overeating uh, American. So artworks express their age, they express uh, certain as uh, point of views of the artist and so forth, and Michelangelo, of course, was expressing the heroic age of the Renaissance and some of the tensions of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation as uh, one period eased or bumped and ground into a, another one. Uh, another contemporary uh, work that doesn't idealize but expresses some of the reality of the uh, human condition is the double portrait of Bertie, painted in the 1950s by American artist Larry Rivers. And while it's probably not a great painting, uh, it is wonderful in the sense that it observes her her aged, paunchy flesh and, and studies it with uh, sensitivity and a certain care. It's, he's not saying, Bertie, you're a fat slob. He's saying, Bertie, what a wonderful, aged, heavy, wrinkled body you have. So he's not criticizing her in this sense. Uh, but somehow, despite its fleshiness, it doesn't have the magnificent, paunchy reality of uh, Bacchus here, painted by Rubens in the 17th century in his Bacchanal and, and look at the heavy 
a golden body of the god of wine and revelry as, <clears throat> as he reaches for the grapes surrounded by satyrs and nymphs in, in joyous uh, drunkenness or enjoyment of life. Uh, there's something of that contemporary artists no longer are capable of attaining in terms of significant form and, and uh, real flesh and a sense of massive volume and, and tremendous compositional uh, paintings like this. And perhaps and c compare you know, the robustness of the Rubens with the tension and anxiety of Edvard Munch's uh, painting Puberty, uh, painted around 1900, 1895, something like this. And, and perhaps the 20th century is not capable of getting some of the massiveness of earlier painters, Rembrandt, the Renaissance, Michelangelo, the Greeks. Of course, the Greeks, were, we primarily know them for their sculpture because we're so worried, we're so nervous, we're so tense, we're so uncertain, we're so rootless, we're so uh, overwhelmed by the tide of events because we have no solid foundation of belief or understanding of ourselves or our place in society or our place in the world, our place in the universe, that kind of thing. And it's not to say that Munch's painting puberty is not solid. It is. And, uh, but it's a picture of tension, of worry. What will I do when I grow up? You know, how am I going to deal with the sex drive? You know, she X's out her pubic area with the crossed arms, protecting both herself from the outside world and protecting herself from, from herself and having to deal with the realities. And of course, what are the realities? Well, the realities are this painting by Alice Neal in the 1968 uh, of Betty Homitsky. And Betty is obviously expressing the result of what happens when one attains puberty and the possibility of fertility. She's pregnant. Her torso is swollen, breasts filled with milk soon to feed the youngster that resides within her. And, you know, maybe we can, and the uh, sense of, of tension in the body as she sits ungainly upon the sofa supporting herself with her hands and we move up to the head and, and we see this, a sense of tension, of questioning that is pure expressionist, that is pure monk, is pure, pure Van Gogh, pure Soutine, pure uh, de Kooning in the sense of the anxiety of our age. And compare the reality of this figure, the homely pregnancy, pregnant state, with the idealized vision of womanhood as a source of fertility, a source of life, painted by Ang, the French painter, in 1856. And it's called the source. And woman is the source of life. She is fertility. And she's the source of waters. Waters are the source, the uh, area of fertility. The sea is, is uh, symbolic of womanhood and, and fecundity and so forth. And she pours water out of her vase and she's the, that is, are the living waters of life that flow into the streams, the trickles to the rivulets, to the streams, to the rivers, to the oceans in a sense. And she is the force of life, but the force of life without any great reality, without any great force of life. This is sort of a slightly neutered uh, neoclassical version of life, a symbol of life, and, uh, but, and somewhat uh, sexless in a sense. Uh, uh, but let's compare it to Ang's next picture called The Turkish Bath, which is a riot of sensuality. So that Ang, in the early to uh, middle 19th century, this picture painted in 1862, uh, combines both poles of expression, both a certain intellectuality and a certain erotic quality, and it, we look into the harem and the concubines writhe and twist in sensuous luxuriousness. They bathe on the left. They fondle one another in certain erotic uh, lesbianic situations, and the figure with the back pl toward us plays a mandolin and so forth. So it's, it's a scene of lush eroticism, but l keep this in mind and look what a contemporary woman artist does to sort of get her own back on pictures of this kind and where women are exploited from her point of view uh, by men. Here we have a 20th century version of the Turkish bath by Sylvia Slay. 
painted in 1973, and she has her male friends posing in the nude, and uh, on the far left, a guitar playing figure seen from the back, and it's, it's to a certain extent poking fun at Ang's picture, and also, as I say, from a women's liberation point of view, um, expressing a certain, say, well, if they can do it to us, we can do it to them. Now, there's, there's only one problem. All that's well and good. It's just not a very good painting. <laughs> uh, Ang's painting is solid. The figures are convincing, volumetric, um, marvelously linked in that sinuous, twi sinuous twisting compositional format that he has. And here, these figures are rather lamely placed side by side, overlapping, excruciatingly uh, photographic uh, in a weak, uh, banal sense, and it's uh, really a, uh, a bad painting. But uh, <clears throat> it will be exhibited, and it is given slide form because it's painted by a woman in a time of let's give women a break in the arts, just as, as women are justifiably trying to find their position in society as well as in the arts. So it's it, and it's sort of catchy, but it's it's not really much of a much of a painting. And, and a similar sense of artificiality pervades Larry Rivers' uh, picture, uh, Dutch Masters and Cigars, in 1963. Now, now there's nothing wrong with painting a picture like this. Uh, he's painted a, a cigar box and uh, somewhat disembodied, somewhat flattened, somewhat not unrelated to each other. But in the top part of it, we see, and of, uh, of course, the name Dutch Masters comes from a painting by Rembrandt. And all artists, great artists, who are called Dutch masters. And in that top picture, we see the uh, syndix of the Draper's Guild, a painting by Rembrandt. And if we can focus in closely on that, compare the two-dimensionality of this and the two-dimensionality of the whole painting, and there are the cigars below, but, but hold that, and we'll go to the next picture, which is the real Rembrandt syndix of the Draper's Guild, painted in the 17th century. And this my friends, I believe is the difference between our time and past times of great art. Uh, ours is not a great period of art. We've loose, loosened our attachment to the world. We've loosened it to our subject matter, to our own feelings, to um, anything real. We've become, we experience life secondhand through the media, through advertising, through our products that seduce us so easily. And River's painting was simply that of uh, literally a magazine advertisement for Dutch masters, whereas Rembrandt captures the living flesh, the solidity of the figures, the real setting. He painted it from the real people. He was commissioned by them uh, to paint their portrait, and so they live. There's psychological interaction between them and the rather diffident little helper who stands in the, right in the center of the picture to the right of the man with the hat. It's a wonderful study of light and dark. But, and above all, it's real. It's based upon real human experience. It expresses Rembrandt's depth of soul and his feeling for life and people. And, and Rivers, unfortunately, expresses just the opposite in that particular picture. And most of his paintings, uh, uh, this, he expresses the superficiality of our own age. And while we're looking at Dutch masters, let's look at Franz Hals from the same period. And his group portrait of the women of the old female regents of the old men's hospice. And look at the character study, and obviously it's closely related to Rembrandt's in terms of his light and dark. Look at those old faces and the characters that, reveal, that are revealed, and you can decide for yourself whether you would want to be in that old men's home with these women looking over you, whether they're uh, sympathetic or not. And we can go to a detail of a couple of them and see them a little more closely. And the woman on the bottom, we can see again even more more closely. So artists of the past, great artists, have dealt with the reality that surrounds them. And Rivers' eclecticism, as well as basically the 20th century eclecticism, that is basing their art on others' art or on other ideas rather than on the direct experience of life, uh, is not new, uh, but it's just reached disastrous proportions in the sense of our being removed from life in terms of our art in the 20th century. We can look at the next picture by Edouard Manet about in the middle 1860s, uh, 1863, called Luncheon on the Grass. And, and this picture, startling in its day for its realism, the flat, direct, expressive realism of the nude figure and the men, and the fact that there was a nude woman combined with clothed men was a great scandal at the time, but 
It's also very freely painted, which caused its, its scandal. Uh, that picture is related to an old master painting. And we can go back to around 1500 with the Italian artist Giorgione and look at nude figures combined with clothed figures. And uh, we can say, well, isn't Manet as bad as Rivers copying this figure, this picture, or borrowing elements from it? And we would say, well, there's a danger in it. But Manet survived it because he painted his own contemporary reality of it from real models, from real, uh, the real flesh and blood and temper of his own time. And we can say, well, Rivers did that. He painted it from his, the temper of his own time. But unfortunately, the temper of our time is bloodless. It's thin. It's removed from reality. It's seduced by the media, television, advertising, a product oriented society, as I've said, are essentially materialistic, cynical, skeptical, <laughs> have I covered it all, uh, nature of our world, unfortunately, where we've lost our sense of, of belief, our sense of, of meaning, our sense that life is not just simply an, an endless series of purchases and ex uh, pleasurable experiences in Bloomingdale's, uh, Macy's, uh, the car shops or what, whatever. So we go back to Giorgione and where Manet's nude women, woman is real, a, a French Parisian woman of the time. These nudes become almost nature symbols. You know, as one dips into the water, again, uh, feminine qualities, talking about the feminine quality of the earth. Another one is like a nymph piping on a flute. And the two men converse in a sense, and, and it's talking about the intellectual relationship, perhaps, of humanity to the earth, of mankind to the earth, where uh, there's a tremendous sense of harmony and wholesome balance. The, this picture does not have to do with lechery or lewdness or <laughs> clothed men about to seduce uh, unclothed women. Uh, that's not the story of this picture, nor was it the story of uh, Manet's picture. We look at another Manet triumph of realism and direct expression of life in his Olympia in 1865 and the direct stark reality of it as she contemplates us, the firm, solid, simple modeling of her body. And, and that picture is borrowed from a Titian Venus of Urbino painted in the 17th, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 16th century. And we see the reclining figure, the hand on the crotch, the serving women in the background, whereas in Manet, the serving women were brought to the foreground. Look at another Titian, the Danai and the shower of gold. And we look at a reclining figure with a, a helping figure on the right, a male figure. And we say to ourselves, what's going on here? What's the shower of gold? There's another dog in the picture beneath her right hand. There were animals in the other two pictures. And Zeus is coming down in the center in that golden shower of light and gold coins to literally seduce and make love to Danai, who has her legs parted for him and her eyes glazed with, uh, shall we say, at least interest and perhaps developing passion for the god who comes down in that divine guise of the shower of gold. So these reclining figures can be mythological, they can be very real, and, and Titian has a knack for making mythology real. There's a certain beefy solidity to the figure, a uh, solid form, powerful structure. You know, compare it to Goya in the late 19th century with his uh, clothed Maha. Uh, Maha is a, a young woman about town of certain bohemian qualities, perhaps. Some people have said this was the, a picture of his mistress, the Duchess of Alba, but uh, apparently that is not the case. But there's a certain sensuality in this. The clothes cling to the forms. We see the thigh. We see the indent thighs. We see the indentation of the crotch. The arms behind the head exposing the breast, saying, you know, I'm defenseless. I'm yours. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. The eyes have a certain come-hither quality. And if we compare it to the nude Maha, we see uh, the sensuality revealed, the r realism of the figure the, uh, uh, is extreme, both in the palpability of the flesh 
and in the uh, sensuality that the body contains. I mean, you compare this, keep it in mind, remember what Ang did with the source, how neutered it was. And it depends upon the artist's attitude, and um, uh, Ang apparently fought against his eroticism, and it would surface uh, periodically, be hidden at other times, uh, where Goya just let it all hang out. I mean, that's just the, the kind of uh, figure he was, kind of man he was. And we're, to we've, we're talking about horizontal figures. We're talking about diagonal figures, nude figures. Look what Paul Gauguin does when he goes to Tahiti and he paints his uh, dusky skinned mis mistress upon a white coverlet coming upon her frightened in their hut, frightened by the spirits of the dead watching. Her uh, <clears throat> religious imagery, her superstitious fear, if we would say, getting the better of her, and we see the dark figure to the left, which is the equivalent of the serving maid in, in Titian, in Danai, in the shower of gold, in Manet's uh, Olympia, and uh, all these other pictures. There, I'm sure are pictures of this sort not only have just a simple tradition of using reclining nudes with serving people or supporting figures, but I'm sure it probably has some fairly deep psychological significance, which I don't have the ability nor really the energy to probe at this moment. So, but compare the, the, the wholesomeness of this pose and the figure, the solidity of it, the three-dimensionality of it, and the increasing modernism of this, of course, as we've moved up to uh, near 1900, 1892, and, and look what happens in our own time in 1942 with Picasso the tradition of the reclining nude and the supportive figure. And, and look, it's called Aubade, A-U-B-A-D-E, and means, means a song in the morning, just as serenade means a song in the evening or afternoon. And what kind of morning is Picasso saying is dawning upon us in 1942? Well, it's the world of the Second World War, of the greatest catastrophe ever to strike humanity. And we see the figure suitably warped and distorted, a parody with her arms behind her head on the left. If you can't tell, that's her head on the left. Stringy hair hangs down, two little cardboard arms behind her neck, her breasts and armpits. There's a little hair coming out of the upper part of the arm. We see her buttocks on top, her crotch toward the lower right, connected with her knee. <laughs> We're all rather unlikely anatomical connections. But this is the 20th century world. This is what has happened to humanity in our own time, as the artists tell us. And uh, we may or may not like abstraction. We may or may not like what Picasso has done with the figure. We may prefer Titian, Manet, Giorgione, and Gauguin. But who can deny the reality that lies behind pictures of this sort that the 20th century has nearly uh, killed us? nearly killed our humanity, and artists have expressed it. And it's nearly killed art, because the artists have allowed themselves to be killed, in a sense. So this is the first part of an exploration of the figure in art. The program's Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Thanks very much for being with me.